Hello and welcome. We appreciate our listeners for the PATC podcast. PATC, Public Agency Training Council, is the country's largest and longest running provider of seminars for police and fire departments, school teachers, school administrators, jail coordinators and jailers. We really appreciate your attendance at this podcast. And I am Mark Waterfill. I'm the president and owner of Public Agency Training Council. With me is David Broadway. David, say hello. Hello, everybody. My name is David Broadway, and I have the privilege of working with PATC. So um, after a 34 law enforcement career, I'm um, I'm happy to be here. And we're happy to have you, and we're happy to have our listeners. We have with us today Tim Randall, one of our excellent instructors. Tim, how about you introduce yourself? Yeah, how you doing? Yeah, great to be here. Um, yeah, I've been an instructor for uh, PATC for about seven years since I retired. I did 31 years in law enforcement, started out my law enforcement career in uh, Los Angeles, and then moved to the mountains of Idaho and uh, uh, worked for an agency here and spent a good majority of my uh, career in investigations, specifically focusing on child abuse and child death investigations, and along with a whole lot of other things. Well, that's fantastic. Uh, why don't you tell our audience a little bit about the things you like to do when you're not instructing for PATC. Uh, What are some of your hobbies? Well, you know, living here in Idaho, we just uh, enjoy the outdoors. So uh, I I live right below a ski resort, so I do a lot of skiing in the winter. And then uh, other than that, we do a lot of kayaking, rafting, biking, camping, hiking, mountain climbing. There's just a lot of great things uh, here in Idaho to do. Tim, tell our audience uh, the classes that you teach. So the three main classes that I teach, I teach basic criminal investigation, I teach interview and interrogation, and then I also teach a recruitment, hiring, and background class. The first two classes, the criminal investigation, again, that's where I spent the majority of my career, and then also in that using the interview interrogation skills. I taught uh, for over 20 years at the basic post-academy interviewing and uh, interrogation skills. Towards the end of my career, I I got involved with uh, working with the Office of Professional Standards, and part of my jobs was uh, the recruitment and hiring and background of officers. So I spent the last part of my career uh, working on that. Which class do you enjoy teaching the most? You know, I, I enjoy them all. It just right now the recruitment, hiring, and, and background seems to be a real hot topic for agencies uh, having trouble, you know, hiring people. The interview interrogation, I guess I've taught it the longest uh, and really enjoy that. It's exciting to share some of the things I've learned over the years and a lot of things I learned in classes just like this. I, I remember attending PATC classes over 30 years ago. Be able to share those things now with officers and just see their excitement, especially when they call me and tell me that they've used those tools or solved a case it's pretty rewarding to be able to, uh, you know, again, share some of the things that, that I've learned over the years. And then the, the basic criminal investigation class is <clears throat> one that's a pretty versatile class because it doesn't matter whether you're a patrol officer to a detective to animal control. Basically, we're, anything we're doing is an investigation. And these are basic skills that anybody can use in any type of investigation in, in doing their job. And so, again, it's that one has a wide spectrum of um, attendees and students and the type of jobs they're doing. Tim, I have something to run by you that's um, close to my heart because I have 150 students at Western Carolina University in the fall, and uh, they depend on me to tell them the um, the story on working fit, working state, working local, and such as that. And we talk a little bit about recruiting and uh, retention. And back in the old days, you know, when I say back when I yeah, started, we could, yeah, we could say that. We could re- say. Yes, yeah. Uh, the retirement was just stellar, outstanding, and that's been eroding over the years. And the retirement age has gone up and uh, retention now. I just saw an article of interest uh, last week, I think it was, about NYPD losing hundreds and hundreds of officers at this time. Yep. Have you got a strategy or anything that you uh, attacked in these um, situations of recruiting and retaining? So, yeah, there is no one magic answer and every agency is different as far as the problems that they're dealing with. From the recruiting standpoint, one of the things that we covered is I, I go into great detail about the difference of average advertising versus recruiting. Most of what we do that we're calling recruiting isn't recruiting at all. It's just advertising. Recruiting is a process, a process of finding those people you want and convincing them to come to work for you. And that takes work. That takes a lot of work. And then again, you got to find the dynamics as far as your agency, as far as the type of people you're looking for and where you go to find those. Again, an agency like, say, New York City Police, it's going to be a whole 
lot different than some agency that's a 5, 10, 20 man department. And the reality is most of the agencies across this country, I think the statistic is that 50% of the agencies across this country are 20 or less people. There's a few big agencies, but most of us are working for these agencies in the 20, 30, 40, 50 man range. And them finding people is a whole lot different than the process of a big agency. So we kind of cover the broad spectrum of all the different tools of things to use, how to find good people. Another thing is how to get good people to find you. The majority of people uh, looking for a job are going to find you through the internet or through social media. So we talk a lot about presence in social media and also on the internet because that's where they're going to go to find you. And so if you've got somebody who's decided they want to go into law enforcement, you got to get them to find your agency. And again, we talk uh, again a lot about other resources of where to find people and some really unknown kind of obscure kind of things that most people don't think about of how to find people. And so, yeah, we cover a pretty wide spectrum and, you know, of how you do that. I would imagine it re- really requires getting out into the community and, and meeting people in order to, to receive referrals and references uh, for new recruits. Right. Again, it's it, it, it takes work. You've got to have people dedicated, assigned, and committed to do that. Again, most of us are just, we put up a sign, we put an ad out online and hope to see what shows up. It takes it takes work to go out and find these people. you got to have those people um, dedicated and also assigned uh, to do that kind of thing. And the other thing is, is that I kind of teach them is that their best recruit tool they have at an agency is their own people. If you did a survey of almost any agency, the two main reasons that people will give to come into a certain agency, the number one reason is they knew somebody at that agency. So you've got to get your people working for you, identifying those people to come to work for you. And the second biggest resource is, again, the internet or social media. So again, it's not just one person's job. you got to get kind of the whole agency on board as far as always recruiting. Do departments pay a bonus for uh, referring a successful candidate? There, there have been, uh, I've been, I've experienced that. The agency I worked at, I, I also work part-time at an agency now doing their hired recruitment and background. And I've talked to others where they do that. I have not seen any actual statistical data, but just from, you know, talking to people, it doesn't seem to be very successful in doing that. And there's a lot of other side problems that come from that also. So yeah, we, we talk about that and good and the bad. And, but my experience has been that paying bonuses does not increase pain and bonuses to the officers and finding, well, I should say, does not increase the amount of recruiting they do. Now, the other side of that, as far as paying bonuses to people to come to work for you, that does work. People will, for money, move or come to you. The question is, are they quality people? Are they coming for the right reason? Are they going to stay uh, on top of that? That end of it, yeah, if you offer signing bonuses for people, that does bring people in. Tim, the state of Florida, I don't know if you've uh, heard of this now, but the state of Florida will give any officer out, outside the boundaries of the state $5,000 to move, to get the people there to apply for jobs. And I thought that was interesting and had a, had a dynamic in Asheville, North Carolina, which is only about, oh, 30, 30 minutes from where I live in the mountains. There were billboards going up with uh, the poor publicity the officers were getting and the perceived not being supported by the community. The, uh, billboards were going up and a couple of them, I remember Winston-Salem put up one and a and an agency from Indiana. Is it Fort Wayne, Indiana? They paid for um, Lamar to have a huge bill billboard put up in town basically saying if you're not respected here we respect and pay our officers so it's been some negative I, things i saw and, that one um, yeah I, I saw yeah, that one yeah and um you know in, in class i kind of chuckle and things like that and uh i try to give these kids a kind of a thumbnail you know thumbnail print or a fingerprint of what they would be doing with different agencies and such as that and pick something that you're passionate about something that you love and something you have a growing curiosity and uh, i can't get into the politics in the classroom i choose not to but it was an interesting dynamic for the kids to see these bulletin boards in Asheville drawing their numbers away. The last time I checked, Asheville Police Department was um, almost touching a third down, and they had to adapt other ways of fighting crime and reporting crime by they won't respond to every every call now. They don't have the personnel. Yeah, and, and that's everybody. That's everybody. And so we're all dealing with the same thing. But I think one of the points I think to get across to your students too is this idea that there's not the public support police agencies is not true. It's not true. If you look at the surveys and if you just turned off K 
cable TV, our job has not changed one bit. There's maybe some, again, some areas that, you know, uh, there's, uh, again, not getting into the politics, areas that are experiencing some difficulties. But overall, our job hasn't changed a bit. The public appreciates us. They respect us. It's just that, you know, cable news is not interviewing those people. They're interviewing the idiots on the street. So exactly. don't your, your kids need to know that. Don't think that you're not appreciated. And, and a good example of that is, you know, when, when we had our soldiers come home from Vietnam, you know, they were treated pretty poorly. And of course, we, we were around when that was. We knew how that was. Since that time, as a general public, we realized that we treated them very poorly. And we're never going to do that again. And so now, if you're in the service, you tell somebody in the service, they tell you, thank you for your service. I've got son, grandson, son-in-law in the service, and they can't go anywhere in uniform that people aren't trying to buy them drinks, buy them their meals, things like that. Because again, they want to let them know. That's a, that's a great point. And like you said, it's not sexy news. You know, it, it, it's, uh, it seems like the net works in the um, in the uh, cable news they always want to report on the on the negative and, and drawing out all the all the negative things in society but you're absolutely right people find out I, I was in for 34 years and the conversation starts up matter of fact that that was a one of the nexus that was the crux of why I wrote book yeah this is what it was like this is what happened Tim before we get off today I understand that you do teach some on uh, school resource officers is that um, correct? yeah yeah I was a I was a school resource officer for five years I also supervise that unit for five years. So, so yeah, we started a, a school resource officer training. So I do that occasionally, not a whole lot. So yeah, do that a bit too. Tell us about your interview and interrogation class. So with the interview interrogation class, so often we, we tend to focus on just the interrogation port, interrogating suspects in that. There was a survey that was done that, you know, looked at police work and what we do. And of course, people have the image of police work as we're chasing bad guys down dark alleys and driving police cars around corners on two wheels and things like that. But the reality is 97 to 98 percent of police work is oral interaction. We're talking to people every day, all the time, whether we're writing a ticket, taking a report, interrogating a suspect, giving directions, you know, it, it's all about oral communication. So the class, we really focus on communication skills. How do we talk to people? How do we get people to talk to us? How do we get information? How do we get more information? How do we get better information? So we really focus a lot on that because, you know, like in the basic police academy, most basic police academies, you're going to spend two to three weeks on shooting, two to three weeks on driving, but something that you use Every single day, you'll get an average of eight hours of interview interrogation skills. And I understand the other things are important because those are the dangerous things that we're doing. And so officers really need more training, again, in just their communication skills. Now, as part of that, too, we also talk about things that we call uh, verbal behavioral analysis, and that is looking at body language to get information from people. And we also get into the interrogation aspect. And a lot of things have changed in interrogation uh, from the way that we used to do things to the way that we do now as far as, you know, the techniques that we use and how we use them. So so we, we cover the wide spectrum. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're a patrol officer, a detective, uh, again, animal control, again, skills that anybody in the job that they're doing uh, can use. I uh, saw 60 Minutes the other night where they were talking about the Ritchie boys who were in, doing and interrogating Nazis, both during and after World War II. And it was very interesting, the tactics that they used. I don't know if you saw that. Yeah, I did. It was very good. Yeah. Excellent. I did also. Yes. Uh, Tim, I, I wanted to get a question, too, because um, what I teach at PAT is um, uh, recruitment of confidential sources. And one of the things I try to tell cops, all my cops that I deal with, no matter what job they're in, is um, if you're going to communicate with somebody, it's about 7% is the a, is a spoken language. I tell them, let your face know that you're glad to talk to this guy, you know. Don't snarl and, and bite back when you don't have to. And uh, most of the time, you don't have to. And that, um, I, uh, w what's your comments on this? Because, um, you know, act, the active listening listening, but good conversationists in police work, they're a rarity sometimes. I, I always like to ask myself, who would I like to interrogate me? What personality, what would they project? Do you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. And uh, one key point there, as far as the listening skills, one of the things we talk about is that if you can become a better listener, you can become a better interviewer. And that's one of the skills that we don't, you know, in police work, there's a lot of skills that we need. And because of our A-type personalities, you know, uh, one of our uh, that, you know, with that APAC person is we're not good listeners, especially us guys. I know my wife's always yelling at me, you know, you're not listening to me. And I don't know, she, something like that. I really wasn't paying attention. But the important thing is um, <laughs> that uh, if we can become a better listener, we can become a, a better interviewer. And another trait we talk about in this too is patience. We are not patient people, again, because of our A-type personality. Teach them skills as far as things you can do to 
work on those patient skills. But again, we talk about this verbal and nonverbal behavioral analysis, again, reading a person. But we also need to understand they're doing the same thing of us. They can tell whether we're interested. They can tell whether we're listening. They can tell whether we think we believe them or not. And so we also talk about looking at ourselves and making sure that, uh, that you know, that we're looking at ourselves as far as making sure that they're reading us correctly, that we show that we're interested, we are interested, that we are listening, things like that. Perfectly said, sir. Yeah, tell us about your criminal class, Tim. What all do you focus on there? So I call it the basic criminal investigation. One of the things I do is I start off with real basics. We talk about criminal code, criminal law, and you know laws of arrest. And the reason I cover those things as far as everything from Miranda to probable cause to evidence, things like that, is because we really don't train our officers clear enough in those areas. You know, we know it good enough to get by, but the reality reality is we really don't know it that well. And one of the things is I talk about probable cause. And I used to in my classes would just pick on somebody and say, give me a, a definition of probable cause. And it's surprising how many officers cannot give you a basic definition of probable cause. Now you take that up to reasonable suspicion and it, yeah, then it gets bad. So, and the reason I cover those things is for several reasons. One is, again, probably the last time I ever really talked about rules, you know, of arrests, you know, rules of law was probably in the academy. We don't train on those things. The other thing is those things change. There are things that Dave and I used to do that, you know, years ago that you can't do nowadays. The things change. And so you have to stay current on case law and what's happened. The biggest reason I cover that is because in a investigation, it's those areas where you will make mistakes that will cost you your case. You can have a video, you can have a confession, but if you make a mistake in one of those rules of evidence, rules of arrest, your case is gone. You know, I tell, uh, uh, you know, these officers, that, uh, you know, that have been to trial stuff just to think about this, that when you go to trial, the defendant is never the one on trial. It's you and your case. You've got a defense attorney who's got a client that's guilty. He can't put him on the stand. So what do they do? They got to go after you. They got to go after what you did, what you did wrong. And that's where a lot of cases are decided in things like suppression hearings, evidentiary hearings. That's the thing there's going to go after. So all it takes is one little mistake. And so you have to pay attention to those details. Also, as far as we cover just basic criminal investigation tools, and we kind of walk through it step by step from first crime scene to investigative tools to interviewing skills, things like that. And then we go into more detail as far as talking about specific type cases, burglar, you know, those type of things we deal with a lot burglary, robbery, domestic violence, child abuse, those kind of things. Again, just cover those in a step-by-step -step process. One of the things I'm big with in doing criminal investigation is checklists to walk yourself through to make sure that you've done everything and covered everything in that process. So again, we just kind of walk them through that process from, from start to end. Do you get into discussion of DNA? A, a little bit. As far as when we, we talk about evidence, type of evidence, how do you use evidence? How do you find evidence? How do you determine what is evidence? What do you process? What you don't process? You know, in a, and again, in overall context. And I also encourage them if they look at more additional training as far as crime scene evidence, reconstruction, those kind of things in process. Tim, real quick, are you, um, do you go into things like jury appeal? Yeah, absolutely. We, we cover that process of going to trial. And that is, first of all, from the start of the case, when you're, if you're the, taking the report, you need to be thinking all the way down the road as far as prosecution. What are the things that you need to cover now? to cover that. We talk about defense attorneys and the kind of things they're going to go after and can we prepare for those kind of things. And also too, again, we talk about juries and what juries are looking for, what appeases juries, what juries don't like. Uh, you know, there's a problem nowadays uh, is this way, they call it the CSI theory. And that is, we have these CSI programs out there that people watch, they believe it. And now these people become our jury members. There was a uh, survey that was done of jury members that said that 25% um, of jurors would not convict uh, unless there was forensic evidence. Knowing that up front, we got to think, okay, we got to find some forensic evidence to appease this jury. Talk about what juries are looking for, what makes them happy, what makes them not happy. One of the things that we talk about too, as far as, you know, can we lie to a suspect? And the answer is yes. Should we? And the answer is no, because surveys have, and studies have shown that juries don't like it when we're coercive with people, when we do those kind of tactics. And I had a, a bailiff in a class one time. So this guy's sitting through court cases all day long. And he told me that the times that he would see a guilty person be acquitted by a jury that he believed that oftentimes that was because of the way they were treated by the police. And so you know, we have to look at that aspect of the process too. And I'm sure you go into a lot of things 
know, say like communicating with a jury, you take the you take the question from the opposing attorney or or the prosecutor, and you turn and you make contact, you know, as much contact as you can with that jury. Correct? Yeah, you got to sell yourself to that jury, so you've got to yes. present yourself to them, look at them. But I also teach them a thing called using the eighth grader rule that when you talk to a jury, you talk as if you're talking to an eighth grader and explaining things to them. For instance, if you were asked on the stand to explain probable cause, could you do it? Well, of course, we got the legal definition that we can give them. But then I tell them, you know, when I get on the stand, I turn to the jury and I said, probable cause is like this. If you were driving by a bank and you heard the bank alarm go off and you looked over and you saw a subject coming out of the bank and this subject was wearing a mask. In one hand, he had a gun. In the other hand, he had a bag with a dollar sign on it. And he was running from the bank. You would think what? And the answer is, that's a clue. The bank is being, that's, the bank is being robbed. That is probable cause that a reasonable person under reasonable circumstances look at something and say, that's a crime. So again, we, yeah, we cover those kind of things. Absolutely. Tim, I got something to run by you. A friend of mine is sheriff of Bavard County in Florida. That's where the Kennedy Space Center is. And uh, he yep, and I worked there. together with the Florida Department of Law Enforcement. When he had a SRO, a school resource officer opening, he'd get one application from his agency. One guy would put in for that change. He saw the handwriting on the walls after all the shooting, mass shootings and things like that. So he said, I got to make this an attractive job. So here's what he did. Wayne Ivey, the sheriff of Bavard, and I'll get your, um, get your feedback on here. It became a career tra- uh, tra- uh, track. You had to have so many years on the SO to put in for it. Then you had a physical assessment. You had a three panel interview, and then you were selected for the job. By being selected for the job, you automatically became a corporal and you were told three years on this job as an SRO, you do a good job for us and you get on the short list for the sergeant's exam. He said it's working really well. And he said he'll have 30 people now apply for uh, one position as an SRO. What's your feelings on that is um, like bringing the SRO position up into a status of, yeah, I want that job. I I see where that can help, obviously. But again, are you attracting the officer for the right reason? Are they there just to get that pay increase, the corporal, things like that? I kind of started before that when I was a supervisor over our school resource officers. And we had an opening. I didn't just sit back and see who the agency found and sent to me. I would get my team together and we would say, who do we want to work with us? And we would come up with a list of names and then we would go out and recruit those officers say, you need to come to work for us. And here's most officers don't, even admin in that, don't really understand what the SROs are doing and how much work they're doing and how beneficial they are. Again, there's just, uh, they just don't understand it. So a lot of officers, they don't really understand the job and so that might not be why they put into it. So that's why we go out. I take my team and say, let's, we want these people. Let's recruit them and tell them you need to come for, to work for us. And here's why. Again, the incentive type things, they do work. The question is, are you getting the right people for the right reason in that process? It's a whole different lifestyle being a resource officer. And if you get the right guy, they will come and stay. When I was uh, working as a juvenile detective, I had a college intern working for me. And then my partner and I thought, we need to get this kid working for us. And so as soon as we had an opening, we called him and said, you're getting down here to test right now. And so he tested, he hired on, did five years in patrol, and then we got him into SROs with us. Uh, he spent uh, 23 years as an SRO and uh, he just retired. Wow. Go out and find those people that you want and get them to go to work for you. Thank you so much, Tim. We really appreciate you visiting with us. Again, PATC is an excellent organization and you are one of our great instructors. We really appreciate all of your hard work. Hey, uh, it's it's just been a blast. Like I say, I'm no expert on anything. I'm just a cop like the rest of people. It's just I learned a lot of things over the years, and now I get to share these things. And so it's just been a, a really great experience to be able to do that and uh, to work for you and a great company and a lot of great people. One, two, three.